Well, in this week, it would be difficult to do a Thursday thought without thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, Friday, which is the 8th of May and which is the 75th anniversary of VE Day in 1945. Um, I feel a particular attachment to that day, not because I was there, although I was alive at that time. I was born on the 12th of April 1945, just three weeks before VE Day. And I have a fascination with what happened at that particular time. As I look back across my life, I thank God for the kind of world I was born into. Just at the end of the most horrific war in which up to 50 million people lost their lives, and in which this country thought for a time it might well have been defeated and subjected by fascism and Nazism. But from 1945 onwards through the 50s and 60s, we were able to build a better world. And I have been one of the people, one of the generation that benefited greatly from that. When I wrote my recent book, Born in a Golden Age, I was thinking mainly about that. Although in the coronavirus lockdown, a golden age doesn't seem just quite as golden as it has been for most of my life. But there it is. And I've been very struck this week looking at the film of VE Day to see the expression of relief and thanksgiving and indeed of joy in the celebration of victory. Now, I think the British people are a generous people, and I don't think in that celebration there was any hatred or any gloating of what had happened to our enemies, but just a deep sense of joy that victory had been secured and that the nation was able to march on to better times. And I've been thinking about this word victory because, interestingly, victory is a Bible word. And it talks about victory in various settings. And as Christians, we're encouraged in the New Testament to have a sense of victory in our life, not a sense of defeat. Let me read you a passage, a particularly appropriate passage for the period between Easter and Pentecost. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and reading from verse 50, I use the NIV. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin and the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And that great chapter is about the certainty, the historical certainty of the resurrection of Jesus our Lord. And then all the implications that flow from it for the present and the future. The passage I've just read to you is about the resurrection at the end of time when Christ returns. And this great phrase, death will be swallowed up in victory. And thanks be to God, the Apostle Paul says, he gives us, and he uses the present tense, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've been thinking about some of the victories that we think about, some of the victories that appear in the pages of Scripture. Certainly in the Old Testament, in a pre-Christian age, there is a great deal about military victories. War is a terrible thing whenever it happens. Some people have said that the Second World War came as close as it is possible to come to the Christian understanding of a just war. And sometimes force has to be used to overcome evil. And there's much of that in the Old Testament. It's interesting that the sceptics and the atheists often turn to the battles of the Old Testament to show how wild and crude it all was. And indeed, war was and is a nasty business. But some of these battles had to be fought. They had to be fought to regain the land. 
they had to be fought to deal with some of the wickedness and evil that was in the world. John Lennox has written a very interesting book, an apologetic book called Gunning for God, Why the New Atheists Are Missing the Target. And he has a whole chapter about is the God of the Bible a despot and deals with the battles of the Old Testament and has some very interesting things to say about the way in which the Jewish army was constrained. It had to act fairly. It had to act justly. But sometimes it was necessary for there to, for there to be a military engagement and to secure a victory. And it's interesting that uh, some of the verses of the Old Testament talk about that. 2 Samuel 8 verse 6, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Psalm 44 verse 6, I do not trust in my bow, my sword does not bring me victory, but you gave us victory over our enemies. You have put our adversaries to shame. And Psalm 60 verse 12 says, with God we shall gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. Now for some people these are hard verses to understand, but these are verses that deal with civic power, with military power, and with the reality of human experience of battle and of victory. But there are other kinds of victories. There are social victories and political victories. There's an interesting verse in Proverbs 11, verse 14, which says, For the lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory secure. And that's not necessarily a military victory. It could be a victory in social and civic circumstances where some evil is rooted out, where some difficulty is solved. I think in modern times, for example, of a body like the Christian Institute that defends Christian values in our society. And recently they've been to the Supreme Court in Britain, I think twice, and on both occasions have had very significant social victories, victories that affect our social life. And we should thank God for that. Um, one of them was about the named person scheme in Scotland. And the other was about the Asher Bakery in Northern Ireland. Now, although for many people these are controversial moments and uh, controversial decisions, they were decisions that gave a victory to freedom of speech and freedom of religion, which is certainly a victory worth having. And then, as we've been thinking, there are spiritual victories, victories that lie not in the physical and in the political, but lie in the spiritual side of our nature. And that's what we've been reading about here, the victory that Christians can enjoy in following Christ, who has conquered death and who has given us a hope for the future. There are, you might say, ecclesiastical victories, victories that the church has won. Now, over the centuries, the church has meddled in warfare when it ought not to have done. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight. So Christians are not encouraged to engage in physical war to achieve their aims. But there are battles that the church has fought and over the centuries has secured victories. In a little book called The Need to Believe, the late Murdo Ewan MacDonald has a, an interesting passage talking about the strength of the church. He says, consider the incredible resilience of the church. At times she has been sick unto death, weakened not so much by attacks from without, but by apostasy from within. And on more than one occasion, it looked as if God himself had abandoned her. Prior to the Reformation, when popes vied with one another in political intrigue and moral lechery, the outlook was grim indeed. So it was in the 16th century when a monk by the name of Tetzel went about selling indulgences at exorbitant prices. So it was in the 18th century when an English king complained that more than half his bishops were atheists. Yet the church recovered to produce men like Martin Luther and John Wesley. How can we explain this except in terms of of the purpose of God. And when you look across the history of the church, there are some remarkable moments when the church has revived and renewed as at the Reformation, as in the revival when John Wesley began preaching, when up to 10% of the population became born again Christians. And I once heard the late uh, Tony Benn saying, the labor movement in Britain owes far more to Methodism than it does to Marxism. So there have been these remarkable uh, spiritual victories. But I think I'd like you to focus on this sense of personal victories, personal victories in our lives. The New Testament says that Christians should live with a sense of the inner power of the Holy Spirit. 
that helps us to rise above the sin and the meanness of the world in which we live. As Christians, we need to score some personal victories over sin, over habits, over discouragements, over failures, over defeat, over anxiety. Now, I guess like me, you've spent a lot of time at home um, thinking about the past. Uh, it's frustrating not to be able to get out and to go on with our lives. And it's very easy to think about the things in the past that have gone wrong, the failures, the weaknesses, the mean things we said, perhaps, the mean things that we did. But one of the important things about Christian life is to know that we can rise above these things. In the New Testament, we are encouraged to confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, our Lord is just and willing to forgive us our sins. And in that wonderful passage in Hebrews chapter 4, where we read about Jesus being our great high priest, we are encouraged to come to the throne of grace. That's a phrase that we frequently use about our prayer meetings. We come to the throne of grace. And you can come to the throne of grace in a prayer meeting with others or privately, and most of us are doing that privately or as a family, coming to the throne of grace. And the passage says, we will receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And that's how Christians secure victories in their life. Victories over resentments, over hurts, over attacks that have wounded us, over things we've said, things we've done. What we should do is confess where we have erred, confess what we have, been done, what we have done wrong, and accept the mercy of the Lord who died for our sins upon the cross and who willingly forgives us when we confess our sins, but also to tap into his grace and his strength, which enables us to live above the fog of this world. 1 John 5 verse 4 says this, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Now, of course, as long as we live in this world, we will never have a complete victory over the things that trouble us. But what we do know is that Christ's victory is complete and certain, and that one day Christ will return in glory and in power, and we shall taste that cosmic victory at first hand. For the moment, we don't want to live as people that have a sense of defeat, a sense of resentment, an undying sense of failure. What we need to do is to come to the Lord in meekness, in confession, in repentance sometimes, accept his forgiveness and taste the victory that comes from the gospel. I started uh, thinking about the war. Let me tell you another little story about the war that uh, I discovered some time ago. There's a hotel in George Square called the Millennium Hotel. It used to be the North British Hotel. And I remember both us when I was young and in recent years visiting that hotel. What I didn't know until relatively recently that in January 1941, there was a very significant meeting held there. President Roosevelt had sent over to Britain um, his special uh, advisor, a man called Harry Hopkins. And Harry Hopkins came to Britain to see the preparations uh, that were being made for the furtherance of the war and to discuss with Churchill ways in which America, not yet in the war, could assist the British. And in the North British Hotel, in the first floor room, they had dinner, the British War Cabinet there with Winston Churchill and Harry Hopkins from America. And at the end of the meal, um, Churchill made a speech and the gist of his speech was to appeal to the Americans to give this country all the help they could and they certainly did that, coming of course into the war at the end of 1941 after the attack on Pearl Harbour. But a very interesting thing happened that night when Harry Hopkins replied to Churchill's message, he quoted the Bible and he quoted a passage from the book of Ruth. He said, I think if, as I recall, he said, here's a passage that my old grandma, I think from Ochterada, would have quoted and would have known. And he took these very precious words of Ruth to Naomi when she said, your God shall be my God. Your people shall be my people. And Harry Hopkins added his own words. 
even unto the end. It is said that Churchill was reduced to tears because Hopkins was signalling to Churchill a profound sense of the American wish to support the British in a time of need. Well, we're not depending on words like those of Harry Hopkins. We're depending on words of our Lord and our Saviour, who sent his people into the world to be his witnesses wherever they went. And this is what he said, I will be with you always. And I think if we get that sense in our hearts and in our minds, then we will experience that sense of victory, which is meant to be the tenor of Christian life. Thank you for listening and may God bless you.